ever dreamed of exploring another world? Could you witness something new? Push boundaries? Or reach for your greatest hope? The experience of every generation is yours. On the History Channel, where the past comes alive. I'm standing here at the World Financial Center. A year ago, this was the site of an American icon, the World Trade Center. Topping the skyline of New York, its majestic twin towers soared a quarter mile over the lower tip of Manhattan. But now all that remains is a gaping space, a place of truly awful memories. Hello, I'm Arthur Kent. Welcome to the History Channel's look back at the 9-11 year, a year shaped by the attacks last September. This was the epicenter, the scene of the most devastating blow the terrorists were able to deliver. The World Trade Center was in many ways a pinnacle of American ambition, ingenuity, and faith in technology. When the towers were completed in 1973, they were the tallest in the world. They inspired awe and wonder in millions. But they would one day inspire resentment, hatred, and a vow of destruction from those bent on a holy war against America. Join us now as the History Channel presents The World Trade Center, Rise and Fall of an American Icon. New York's World Trade Center took nearly 12 years to build. Its designers virtually reinvented the skyscraper, bringing brilliant solutions to difficult engineering problems. Then came September 11th. A new set of catastrophic technical problems must be confronted. At the World Trade Center sites, it seems like everything was pulverized. We move very quickly to bring in all the federal agencies. Rescue workers must search for victims among blazing rubble. There's just no way to describe it unless you see it. There's nothing to compare it to. A million tons of dangerous debris must be removed before more lives are endangered. We're dealing with a moving target. A 16-acre disaster site carefully mapped. The North Tower is right here. Missing persons identified using only a fragment of bone. When you can say to a family, here are your remains, it does bring very good closure to them. And an engineering autopsy must seek the truth about how and why the buildings fell. We have looked at well over a thousand photographs, video footage. We studied well in excess of 200 hours in detail. The mammoth rescue and recovery effort and far-reaching forensic and engineering analyses are without precedent in American history. Engineers, architects, and scientists would have to fashion sense out of madness. September 11th, 2001, a day of grief, a day of courage, a day no one will ever forget. This is how that day unfolded. Everybody said, you're nuts. Planes don't fly over midtown. Uh, within a few seconds, you heard like a boom, and the building shook. My daughter called me. She said, a uh, plane just flew into the World Trade Center. I said, nah, you gotta be kidding. Said, it's gotta be a pipe or cover. Some clown was flying down the river. At 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston, with 92 aboard, traveling at a speed of 470 miles per hour, strikes the north tower of the World Trade Center complex. All of a sudden, coming past our window, was a blizzard of paper and small snowflake-like particles. And the first thing that crossed my mind was a ticker tape parade, but it just didn't make any sense. 
And so we looked in the direction of the source of the paper and we saw that the tower, one, was on fire. The aircraft was banked quite steeply at the time it actually hit the building. So instead of going in and affecting maybe two floors, it affected four or more floors. The impact leaves a jagged hole in the structure's north face from the 98th down to the 94th floors. Following the impact, the physical weight of the building is redistributed. The undamaged portions take on the work of the missing parts. The north side of the building started working somewhat like an arch so that the loads that were coming straight down now had to come down, go around that hole, and be picked up by the columns that were still in place. But structural damage is not all the building must withstand. Of the 10,000 gallons of jet fuel aboard the aircraft, as many as 3,000 gallons ignite and are consumed within two seconds. 4,000 gallons disperse as a fiery vapor cloud. Those floors are immediately set on fire. All of the carpets, the furniture, any combustible inside the building. Within minutes, officials coordinate the citywide emergency response. Their base of operations is a state-of-the-art command center located on the 23rd floor of 7 World Trade Center. It's operating fine. Uh, the deputy director for planning, Rich Rotans, has the platform. The agencies are starting to come in as automatically would happen, and we're reaching out to those agencies that are unaware. With one tower in flames, the tragedy is only beginning. It is 9.03 when United Airlines Flight 175, with 65 aboard, traveling at the speed of 590 miles per hour, smashes into the south tower of the World Trade Center. Instead of a dead-on impact, as occurred with the North Tower, this aircraft strikes the corner of the South Tower. It rips a diagonally shaped gash from the 84th to the 78th floors. It was banked at a somewhat steeper angle so that more floors were hit. It was going almost 100 miles an hour faster than the one that hit the North Tower. And that makes it worse. The zone of impact on the South Tower is 20 stories lower than that of the North Tower. Therefore, the damaged structure is supporting a heavier load. All of these things combined added up to that building having more severe damage than the North Building, and therefore we think that's one of the reasons that it came down first. The fires inside the towers weaken steel supports called trusses that hold up each floor. Thus compromised, the trusses give way. The South Tower lasts only 56 minutes before it succumbs at 9.59 a.m. It strikes the ground at a speed of 124 miles per hour. The floors below could not possibly withstand the weight of scores of stories coming down on that with the, sort of the impact and thrust load of that. A dust cloud billows outward for blocks. Victims stagger away. Some clutching scraps of clothing over their nose and mouth so they can breathe. Alan Reese, the man responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the World Trade Center complex, is one of the lucky ones who escapes harm. He finds cover under an overhang at Five World Trade. You couldn't breathe, you couldn't see, and then slowly, you began to see a little light, then you realized you were still alive. But we were covered with ash. It looked like the nuclear winter. 
After the South Tower falls, city officials manage the disaster response from their command center, but they won't be there for long. Somewhere in that time, and it's very hard to keep track of time during this, they had been ordered to evacuate number seven by the Port Authority. To this day, we don't know who gave that order, but whoever it was saved a lot of people's lives. At 1028, the television mast atop the North Tower spears straight down. Once the collapse started, there really wasn't any way to stop it. It was just going to go all the way down once it got started. Chaos in New York City. Power is down in lower Manhattan. Phone lines jammed with more than 230 million calls. Hundreds of firefighters trapped in the towers. Hundreds more race to the scene. When the world is coming down around you, you have to keep your head. It sounds trite, but it's the absolutely essential element to anything to do with emergency service communications. Falling debris from the collapse of the North and South Towers ignites fires in the neighboring buildings of the World Trade Center. World Trade 4, 5, and 6 are ablaze. World Trade 7, the building housing the city's command center, burns unchecked for seven hours. At 5.20, it collapses. The city's emergency nerve center is destroyed. Temporary quarters, in the form of a mobile communications trailer, are pressed into service. The mayor needs to have accurate information so he can run government. So the first thing that, that was already started was our command vehicle, which is an over-the-road coach converted to a uh, command center. It seats about 20 people and has full communications backup. With New York a war zone, some residents walk across the Brooklyn Bridge to get out of the city. Others seek escape in vessels piloted by the Army Corps of Engineers. Using eight boats, the Corps of Engineers removed and evacuated approximately 3,000 individuals, including many that were injured, to locations in New Jersey and in Brooklyn. Uh, some of the tugboats had actually pulled bed sheets out and spray painted on there where they were going, Brooklyn, Hoboken, whatever. At 7.45 p.m., the New York Police Department says 78 officers are missing and estimates that 200 firefighters are dead. It's terrible. I mean, the damage is terrible. People are doing everything that they can to rescue as many people as possible, and this was going to be a long-term effort. So I just wanted to make sure that everything is here that could be here, and it is. So we just pray to God that we can save a few people. By 10 p.m., Mayor Rudolph Giuliani seeks to calm fears that the attacking planes carried airborne chemical or biological agents. The health department has done tests and at this point is not concerned. But so far, all the tests that have, we've, been, we've, we've done do not show an undue amount of asbestos. It doesn't show any particular chemical agent that we have to be concerned about. The City Department of Environmental Protection started monitoring almost immediately. We have a very large monitoring program going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The air sampling program focuses on three zones. A passive collector unit mounted on a pole takes in air upwind and crosswind of ground zero. Spectrographic analysis reveals normal background levels of airborne chemicals. Downwind. Investigators find airborne irritants in excess of normal levels, but attribute them to the fires burning at the site. At 10.56 p.m., police officials say they believe there are victims alive in the rubble of the World Trade Center. 
working with urban search and rescue teams, there was a lot of areas to be searched underneath the debris field. There were voids that had to be searched for possible live people. September 11th, 2001, the longest and most tragic day in New York's history is drawing to a close. I lost 14 Port Authority employees that worked directly for me and then two supplemental employees, so 16 in total, plus mechanical staff, uh, secu 11 security guard staff, and it goes on and on. Been to almost 40 funerals or wakes or memorial services so far. The 16-acre site would become the proving ground where rescue workers and investigators faced the most difficult challenges of their lives. Just behind Ground Zero, you can see one of the city's first great skyscrapers, the Woolworth Building, opened in 1913, and it was known then as the Cathedral of Commerce. The skyscraper was a New York invention, a place of business that seemed to reach to the heavens. The World Trade Center towers were conceived as the ultimate skyscrapers. They would symbolize the global dominance of American capitalism. Tragically, they would also become a target to its enemies. For many, the twin towers of the World Trade Center expressed what was big and bold about New York. 50,000 people worked in 10 million square feet of space. Each floor was a full acre in size. Each 110-story tower had 99 elevators. The entire complex was dense with the hum of humanity. On September 11th, 25,000 people were able to escape. In part, that was thanks to the tower's designers and caretakers, who had gone to great lengths to make them a safe place in which to work. We had a routine where certain structural integrity elements were inspected either two, two year cycle, four year cycle, or eight year cycle. Much more than anything that a building code would require, we kept up and maintained our buildings these buildings were built as well or better than uh, you would expect any building to be built under those coats. There were three emergency stairways in each tower. There were 828 emergency exits, 300 security guards, and six emergency generators that provided 7,200 kilowatts of electricity, enough to power 4,000 suburban homes. There was a backup diesel power plant on site and a command center to monitor all building systems using 300 security cameras. The designers even foresaw that an airplane might crash into one of the towers. Frank DiMartini was a project manager at the World Trade Center who perished on September 11th while trying to help others escape the North Tower. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. But no one anticipated an act of terrorism as bold as it was horrible. The idea was that the plane might be lost in the fog, leaving or arriving to JFK or LaGuardia airports. Not a terrorist attack, not an aggressive attack. The uh, speeds, therefore, were thought to be lower. When the towers were being built, a terrorist attack on American soil was simply inconceivable. It was an optimistic time, ripe with energy and promise, when America wanted to build the biggest and the best. The Twin Towers were completed in 1974. They became the tallest buildings in the world, but neither the World Trade Towers nor any other tall buildings would have been possible without two critical engineering developments. First, the elevator. You can't have a tall office building without the elevator. And the first commercial building that was built with an elevator was the Equitable Life Assurance Company's headquarters on Broadway. It was built in the late 1860s. The next major advance 
was the development of the steel skeleton frame, uh, which occurs in 1888 when the tower building uh, is built, which was probably the world's first building with a steel skeleton frame. With the steel skeleton and the elevator, the Manhattan skyline began an extraordinary transformation. Within only a few years after the tower building was completed in the late 1880s, you have enormous skyscrapers being built that were rising 20, 30 stories. These would not have been possible if the economics hadn't changed, if banking and commerce and trade and the insurance businesses weren't growing. During the first decades of the 20th century, some of New York's most famous skyscrapers were built. In 1903, the Flatiron Fuller Building. In 1909, the Metropolitan Life Tower reached 700 feet. And in 1913, the Woolworth Building soared 792 feet. The next great development in skyscrapers occurred in the 1920s. It culminated in 1930 and 1931 with buildings like the Chrysler Building and, of course, the Empire State Building, which was the world's tallest building for the 40 years before the World Trade Center. During each one of those cycles, there was a, a boom in the economy that drove the heights of buildings ever taller. It was in 1946 that New York lawmakers first conceived the idea of an international or world trade center. The idea came about that there would be a big trade mart based on the ancient fair in Leipzig, which went back to the Middle Ages. There would be a, a fair, a permanent trade exposition in New York where people from all over the world could come and show their goods. But when market research revealed that the city would benefit more by modernizing its ports, the idea was scrapped. It wouldn't resurface again for more than a decade, and only then under the aegis of urban renewal and the influence of one of New York's most famous heirs, David Rockefeller, grandson of Standard Oil founder and billionaire John D. Rockefeller. In 1958, Rockefeller spearheaded what was called the Billion Dollar Plan to stimulate business and revitalize Lower Manhattan. His vision was to spend a billion dollars of private and public monies to create a kind of gleaming futuropolis. And the core of this thing is going to be this great public purpose, a world trade center that will secure the future of New York City's port forever. So they said, well, here's all this stuff we can demolish over on the east side. This, by the way, is where the um, South Street Seaport is today. All the preserved buildings are today. But at that point, it was considered fair game. Right? They're 19th century buildings. Knock them down. It should also be pointed out uh, that David Rockefeller's brother was Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York. So this is very helpful in pushing the project through. To fund and build the new project, David Rockefeller and his supporters turned to the Port Authority. This agency was chartered in 1921 by the states of New York and New Jersey to build and operate all terminals or transportation facilities such as bridges, tunnels, and train lines within a 25-mile radius of the Statue of Liberty. The Port Authority is a hybrid creature, partly a government agency and partly operating as a private business. Uh, no one else had quite the same combination of deep pockets and financial resources, uh, the right of eminent domain, and the technical engineering skills to launch a big project. The other great power that the Port Authority has stems from the nature of public authorities in general. If you want to build a project that costs a billion dollars, you simply sell bonds to do that, and then you charge rents or tolls or something like that to pay those bonds off. The self-supporting agency built, owned, and operated several megastructures, such as the Lincoln Tunnel and the George Washington Bridge. By the early 1960s, the World Trade Center project was added to its portfolio under the auspices of Port Authority Director Austin J. Tobin. There was a kind of professionalism that the Port Authority was known for in its engineering and its planning and its whole way of carrying things out, which was really impeccable. Really impeccable. And Tobin was the guy who did that, and he was the central point of control. He was the Sun King. The original plan was to put it on the east side of Lower Manhattan. Bear in mind 
that the Port Authority is a bi-state agency. So understandably, uh, the governor of New Jersey was concerned. He said, well, you're building this uh, World Trade Center for New York. What are you going to do for us? The Port Authority agreed to take over New Jersey's bankrupt Hudson and Manhattan commuter railroad, today known as PATH, the Port Authority Trans-Hudson Line. This railroad had been running since 1908 and was in dire need of a facelift. Its terminus was on the west side of Lower Manhattan. Once this deal was in place, that New Jersey was getting the path, New York was getting the Trade Center, gradually it hit everyone. Why not put it on the west side, and then you could do two projects at once. It was a brilliant breakthrough, and the governor of New Jersey said, at least we can see the damn thing. By 1962, the World Trade Center project was moved from the east side to the middle of a west side neighborhood known as Radio Row. It was a bazaar of retailers, mostly involving consumer electronics of some kind. And this was where the first TVs were sold off the shelves in the United States. I mean, this was the consumer appliance mecca. Radio Row merchants protested but their shops would vanish by way of the wrecking ball as plans to build the biggest complex in Lower Manhattan geared up. Ultimately, they didn't have much of an argument when you compared what, in the minds of the various judges who heard the cases, was the public good. Well, I mean, you're just a business. You can go and you can move someplace else. But this is Lower Manhattan. And the financial district has to expand. I mean, look, you guys got to get out of the way. The merchants were bought out. Planners decided the World Trade Center site would occupy 16 acres, but it was not yet known who would design it. When Yama received the letter, uh, we looked at the letter, and, and Yama kind of called us together and said, you know, it just shows how <clears throat> careful you've got to be when you write a letter of invitation like this, because here's a project that obviously has a misplaced decimal point. It's got too many zeros. Who would be asking our firm to do a project of 250 million? But we prevailed upon Yama to follow through and make a call. It was the call that changed his life. Out of a field of more than a dozen prominent architects, Austin Tobin and the Port Authority chose Minoru Yamasaki and his firm out of Michigan to design not only the Twin Towers, but an entire complex of buildings that would surround them. The project would become a symbol not only of New York, but also of America. It was 1962 when Japanese-American architect Minoru Yamasaki won the contract to build the World Trade Center complex. Yamasaki was a, a rather strange choice as an architect because he had never built anything on this scale before and most of his uh, previous buildings had been rather precious boxes, buildings that were detailed and uh, ornamented in a way that you wouldn't expect to relate to the size of the World Trade Center. He was also uh, famously uh, a, a strange pick because he had fear of heights. What impressed the Port Authority was Yamasaki's grasp of engineering and his character. He was a self-made man, rising from a hard scrabble childhood in Seattle to fame as an award-winning architect. They saw someone who was similar in some ways to them and to their values. This was not an architectural prima donna. Yamasaki wanted to build two towers that would soar 80 stories. He wanted visitors to think of the generous open space of Piazza San Marco in Venice when they came to work in the World Trade Center. Although they were giants, the World Trade Towers were to have a human touch. Windows were designed shoulder width to give people a sense of security, no matter how high the floor. But the Port Authority wanted to make one small change in the plan, a change that would make the towers a magnet for worldwide attention the very fame that would later help turn them into twin targets. Given the square footage demands of, of the World Trade Center project, uh, the Public Relations Department began to say, well, why not make it the tallest building in the world? This presented an engineering and economic challenge for the architect Yamasaki. 
Mr. Yamasaki was very, very nervous about that because of the cost of pushing those extra floors in. He was fearful that the economics of the project would dictate to stripping away some of the planting in the plaza, the flowers in the plaza, the sculpture in the plaza, and even in the lobbies, the stainless steel doors, all of these things that he was so fond of. At the start, the budget was an unheard of $335 million. In 1966, it ballooned to $575 million. The 1,250-foot Empire State Building, the tallest building in the world since 1931, was about to be eclipsed by the new 1,360-foot towers of the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center was conceived when American ambition and a faith in technology was really at its peak. If you think of the other sort of supersized topics of the day, like jumbo jets, you have some sense of the sort of ambitious love of bigness that the World Trade Center represents. To make the towers the tallest in the world, Yamasaki not only had to rethink the structure, but also had to consider the ground upon which they were to be built. A major problem in the construction of the World Trade Center was the fact that it was going to be built in Lower Manhattan in an area which was fundamentally fill. You have to think about the geology of the area. Lower Manhattan represents the confluence of two large rivers and the ocean. Since the 1600s, ambitious landfill operations extended the waterfront of Manhattan by more than 700 feet. Dirt, rocks, and even old piers and wharves were used to build up the existing land. To reach bedrock, engineers would have to dig down 70 feet and at the same time not disturb the foundations of the surrounding buildings. If you start to dig a hole, what happens is that if you only go down three feet, your hole fills up with water. They needed to dig not just a three-foot hole, but a very, very large hole. The first obstacle, then, was how to control and remove the water while laying a foundation for the enormous structures. They had to come up with wonderful engineering techniques to actually pour that foundation uh, while all this water was pressing in on the, uh, on the foundation structure itself. The project engineers decided to utilize the slurry trench method. It had been used for subway construction in Europe and in Canada, and now would be used for the first time in the United States. For this project, excavating machines would dig a three-foot wide trench down to bedrock. As dirt and rock were removed, they would be replaced by slurry. Slurry is a mixture of water and bentonite, a type of clay that swells and would plug any hole along the side of the trench as excavators dug deeper. Workers lowered a pre-assembled seven-story high steel cage of reinforcing rods weighing 22 tons into the slurry trench. Then concrete was placed at the bottom of the excavation using a long pipe called a tremi pipe. As the concrete flowed in, it displaced the bentonite. Construction workers made 152 of those 22-foot trench segments to enclose an area two blocks wide and four blocks long. It was like building a bathtub, only it's a bathtub in reverse. The purpose of this bathtub, 800 feet long, 200 feet wide, 70 feet deep, was not to contain water, but to keep water out. And the bathtub, you could have swum, Moby Dick could have done laps in the bathtub because it was that big. After the towers were attacked, portions of the slurry wall collapsed under falling debris, and the mighty waters of the Hudson would try to reclaim their domain. But during construction, the slurry wall fabrication was just one of the challenges to be faced. Landfill had to be removed from an excavation seven stories deep. It would tally up to a million cubic yards to be transported in 100,000 truckloads. Instead of carting this dirt all the way to New Jersey or hauling it way out to sea, simply place it on the west side of West Street. They measured out an area just west of West Street, which would extend 700 feet out into the Hudson River, be 1,400 feet long, in other words, about the size of uh, six city blocks. 
The new landfill created some of the most valuable real estate in the country, some $90 million worth of land that eventually became Battery Park and the World Financial Center. Now that the foundation was in place, thousands of tons of steel had to be hoisted up over 100 floors. In past construction of skyscrapers, derricks were used. But a derrick had to be constantly lifted to a higher position, one floor at a time, costing several man hours. Derricks also had to be powered from the ground, with extremely long cables running down through the floor already built. The answer was a self-powered crane that came from across the globe. These were the so-called kangaroo cranes, uh, nicknamed because they're coming from Australia, and they were put at the corner of each building. And what these kangaroo cranes essentially were able to do was to hoist themselves up uh, with automatic machinery built into the crane such that the crane could rise as the building went up. The crane's diesel motor supplied the power, driving a series of hydraulic lifts installed at the base of each corner. Then an interesting problem at the very end is how do you get the kangaroo crane down? And uh, the, the way that was done is they had to be disassembled and brought down by elevator. Construction of the Twin Towers began in August 1968. Architect Minoru Yamasaki would move away from conventional techniques to create a completely different type of skyscraper. The common sense way of understanding the construction of a skyscraper, we think back to our childhood, is building it like an erector set. You have uh, little uh, pieces of steel which you hold together with rivets and grommets and it's like building a cage. This is the normal way of building a steel skyscraper. It's a cage-like construction. You have uh, vertical members and horizontal members, and you build little boxes, and you pile box upon box upon box, and thus you have a skyscraper. Yamasaki uh, wanted something different. It was a pioneering design decision that proved to be a critical choice affecting the lives of thousands on September 11th. What Yamasaki came up with, in conjunction with structural engineers, is to make the skin of the building much stronger so that you wouldn't need internal columns. The towers were examples of what engineers would call tube structures. Visualized from above, they were approximately square, 209 feet on each side, with 59 columns on each face forming the tube. The core, containing elevators, stairwells, and mechanical equipment, consisted of a rectangular arrangement of 47 columns. It was a revolutionary way to construct a high-rise building. The tube design was an innovative concept, but in practice, the elevators required would have taken up too much space. Seeking a solution, designers divided each tower into three parts, or zones, each with its own sky lobby. People would be able to get to work by taking an express and then a local elevator. People readily accepted it because the truth was uh, that this system, even though it involved two rides, the express ride and the local ride, actually saved time and resulted in a shorter wait. The last piece of steel was put in place on the North Tower on December 23, 1970, and on the South Tower in July of 1971. Finally, on April 4, 1973, the plaza sculptures were in place and the complex was ready for the ribbon-cutting ceremony. One of the dignitaries attending was the governor of New York, Nelson A. Rockefeller, who said, it's not often that we see a dream come true. Today, we have. For the next 20 years, about 50,000 people reported to work each day at the World Trade Center, while an additional 200,000 visitors passed through. It became the hub of the New York Financial District, and for many, the heart of the city. Then, on February 26, 1993, the World Trade Center received the first major test of its structural integrity. A bomb with the destructive power equal to 2,200 pounds of TNT exploded in the parking garage of the second floor basement of the North Tower. Six people died 
and more than a thousand were injured when the bomb exploded at 12.18 p.m. All I remember is a tremendous loud sound and a blast of wind going behind me. And the secretary that was walking with me that day, and she was heading down the hall to the carpenter's office, both of her legs were broken. The explosion ripped through the basement floor, creating a hole 100 feet wide and four stories deep. But the damage was minimal, given the size of the bomb. That's because the trade towers were built to withstand hurricane force winds of 150 miles per hour, more stress than was exerted by the blast. After the 1993 attack, what concerned engineers most was the slurry wall that kept out the waters of New York Harbor. The horizontal basement floors that helped support the wall were damaged. But within 36 hours, additional bracing solved that problem. 20 days after the blast, the World Trade Center reopened its doors. Extra security measures were put in place. Tenants and visitors to the building would wear electronic identification badges. Parking lot access was also restricted. A worldwide two-year-long manhunt produced a suspect in the bombing. And later in 1998, Ramzi Youssef was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for his role in planning the attack. Investigators believe that he is an Al-Qaeda operative. No one dreamed that some eight and a half years later, the same terrorist organization would bring death not from a bomb in the basement, but from the sky. In 1993, terrorists tried to topple the World Trade Center and failed. But the buildings remained at the top of their target list, and what they could not destroy from below, they would attack by air. Years of planning culminated on September 11th as two hijacked jets slammed into the towers and exploded. In less than two hours, the buildings were reduced to rubble and dust. Within a day, thousands of people began a desperate search for survivors. September 11th, the most deadly terrorist attack ever on American soil. A day later, on September 12th, missing persons still numbered in the thousands. Thousands of rescue workers swarmed the scene, and officials were asking for even more help. People want to help out, whether they're medical professionals or construction workers or just simply people who want to volunteer. We'll be able to sign them up and be able to call on them as this process goes forward, not just for days, but for weeks and weeks. FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, was in charge. But the large volunteer response at the site nearly overwhelmed the agency's capabilities for organization. The agency dispatched 1,300 workers to Ground Zero. There were nearly 2,000 more from other agencies, including the Red Cross, the FBI, the New York City Police and Fire Departments. The local contractors really reacted quickly, so there was a lot, a lot of equipment here. I mean, everybody tried to help. There were 16 acres of debris to pick through. Rescue workers had to avoid dangerous hot spots where jet fuel fires burned. Move a mountain of debris. At first, bucket by bucket because authorities feared that heavy machinery might endanger survivors buried in rubble. With all air travel grounded as a safety precaution, disaster response teams had to find other ways to get to New York. We had people who drove from Florida, drove from Kansas City, drove from Chicago. You know, these are key people, dedicated people, who basically jumped in their cars and drove. Later, when airports reopened, and as FEMA continued to focus the rescue effort, urban search and rescue teams came from as far away as California. These are specially trained, equipped, ready-to-go fire department teams 
who are experts in urban search and rescue. Take that line slow. And those teams coordinated with the city to go down to the site and help the city as the city needed it. The coordination activity there has been phenomenal. Um, if you can only imagine every city agency that, that you've ever conceptualized of, every federal regulatory agency, every federal assistance agency, and trying to get all of these people on the same page has been a considerable task. In the first 24 hours after the attacks, more than 260 pieces of heavy equipment and 240 trucks converged on the site to sift through the debris, which towered to a height of 60 feet in some areas. It's a very complex process because you have to understand that the World Trade Center towers were not these two towers that rose out of a cornfield and they collapse and you come and move it all away. It's really quite the contrary. The towers were located over an enormous basement. The whole property is 16 acres and there were low-rise buildings as well and each tower is just one acre out of the whole 16. FEMA also called on the Army Corps of Engineers, an organization with extensive experience in disaster recovery operations. But the Army Corps had seen nothing like this in its history. Well, we had some of our debris specialists had worked uh, Hurricane Andrew, uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, of course, you have the recent events at the Pentagon. This is more than 10 times the debris that's at the Pentagon. None of our debris experts who have a pretty fair amount of experience in debris operations have ever seen anything like this. And we've used virtually all of the debris trained uh, specialists within the Corps of Engineers at the World Trade Center site over the past two months. The work was particularly difficult because there was an enormous amount of debris in a relatively small location. Crews were also constantly on the lookout for survivors. Within 48 hours after the attacks, only five survivors would be pulled from the wreckage. By September 13th, the crews settled into a grinding 24-7 schedule that allowed them to remove 70,000 tons of debris a week. And daily, 75 trucks laden with debris rumbled through New York, one of the world's busiest cities. It was pretty clear to everybody that with the amount of debris that was there, trucks were probably not going to be a long-term option. Then all those trucks trying to make it out of Manhattan across Staten Island, if things were ever going to return to normal in New York, you were going to have to get away from that situation. The trucks were making a 20-mile trip through the city to cart their load, and health officials were concerned about particulates, including asbestos, blowing off them and into the lungs of New Yorkers. Personnel and vehicles leaving the site were scrubbed down to guard against pollution. The Army Corps of Engineers knew there had to be a more efficient and safer way to move the debris. Joe Sebold, New York liaison to the Army Corps, began looking into it. From the beginning, I've been involved in coordinating with the city, state, and federal agencies, working with contractors to help facilitate some of the actual development of the operations that you're seeing here. The Army Corps of Engineers began to investigate using a nearby transportation resource, New York Harbor. A single barge could carry the load assumed by 30 trucks. But a barge with that kind of capacity could not pass unless 155,000 cubic yards of material were dredged from the harbor bottom in two locations near piers used as loading points. There was permitting issues, disposal of dredge material issues, survey work, analysis of the types of equipment that could efficiently operate in this type of an environment. As Joe Sebode worked through the logistics before he could begin dredging, the Corps focused on another area of its expertise, creating maps that helped recovery workers navigate the disaster site. The Corps prepared a series of enhanced views of the site, providing rescue workers with maps that showed where the debris still burned. 
It was an automated program similar to your computer-aided design software. It could then superimpose uh, some of the uh, infrared temperature readings that were being taken uh, by remote sensor devices and other means and, and display it in, in different ways. Even more sophisticated was a process called light detection and ranging, or LIDAR. By early afternoon on September 15th, this Piper Navajo Chieftain aircraft, equipped with lasers, gathered data from a vantage point 5,000 feet above the disaster site. Then the New York Office for Technology, the agency overseeing the operation, called in an expert to turn the raw data into useful maps. We got a call saying, you're the only operational environment in town. Get your staff together and start making maps. For more than seven years, Dr. Sean Ahern has been mapping every square inch of New York City from the sky. Suddenly, his work was a matter of life and death, because rescue workers could use his maps to safely find their way around ground zero. We mobilized instantly. We worked all night. The next morning, we literally took three of our computers with the New York City database on board, loaded them into a police cruiser, went down and set up what would be the seeds for a very significant mapping operation, which would grow to some 30 computers. It's a really professional mapping operation. To generate a LIDAR map, an aircraft equipped with lasers flies over the site. The laser fires at the ground surface, the data collected will allow scientists to calculate the distance from the plane to the particular topographic feature being measured. Millions of these points are plotted on a computer and joined to form a visual representation of the surface, accurate to within six inches in height. It became a particularly important tool because at the wavelength that the laser fires, the smoke is transparent. So this was the first unimpeded view of the entire site. I still remember vividly, we printed one of these maps out. It was about 40 by 50 inches. I brought it into the command center. I had a group of firemen around me, and I rolled it out on the floor. Pretty soon, it, it didn't take long, they were able to interpret this image and relate it to their on-the-ground experience. For the first time, the actual scope of the disaster was visible and firefighters could better orient themselves. The North Tower is right here. You see you just have that shell of the facade there. And here's the South Tower is right here. And there's the center of where the South Tower stood. And the Marriott, uh, all that's left of the Marriott is this little pile right in the back here. And finally, Ahern's team was able to calculate the extent of the damage at the site. They estimated there would be more than one million tons of debris to be removed. They would later learn that their estimate would be far too low. For the first week following the disaster, rescue and recovery workers had combed through the wreckage of the World Trade Center hoping to find living victims or discover their remains. The recovery is not going to be done until the last person is found. It's still a recovery of missing people. It's going to be till the very end, until everybody's recovered. Outside the boundaries of the 16-acre disaster site, the city struggled to get back online. The stock exchange reopened on Monday, September 17th under new security measures. Verizon, the local phone company, sent 3,000 technicians into the field to repair or reroute 4 million voice and data circuits. Most of lower Manhattan was without electricity after the collapsing tower severed electric feeder cables. Two consolidated Edison substations were also destroyed with the collapse of World Trade No. 7. 1,900 Con Edison workers laid more than 36 miles of temporary cable, and on September 19th, power was restored to Lower Manhattan. A team of structural engineers made their way into the smoking ruins of the World Trade Center and the buildings surrounding the site to assess the damage. Some structures, like Seven World Trade, were beyond repair. 
Others, like the Bankers Trust Building, were considered salvageable. On Saturday, September 15th, engineers began their first detailed inspection of the basement levels. Before the attack, the World Trade Towers rested on an underground city. Seven levels of shops, parking structures, utility basements, and subway stations that once served 150,000 people a day. One of the things that we're experiencing that, that's making me a little bit more uncomfortable is that we're experiencing progressive collapses on a daily basis. Heavy equipment on site sometimes caused unstable sections of the basement to collapse, rendering those sections impassable. We're dealing with a moving target. Day by day, the conditions are changing under us as we're going down. The collapse of the 110-story towers left a chaotic jumble of material that still burned from the jet fuel fires. The fire is burning from the bottom because you have so many million square feet of office space that are in those towers. What kind of combustibles are in a million square feet of office space? The paper, the furniture, the carpets. The fires got very intense down there and actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. No one knew where underground fires might trigger explosions and take more lives, or which subgrade levels were safe and which were death traps. Engineers making their inspections and rescue workers searching for victims desperately needed an accurate map of the basement levels. George Tamaro had one. For example, well, let's look at this B1 level. This is one level below the street level at West Street and two Tamaro is lead engineer in the firm of Muser Rutledge Consulting Engineers. He was in charge of the team that supervised construction of the slurry wall. By Friday, September 14th, he had put together a book of photographs and drawings depicting the site before and after the attacks. He made color copies and handed them out to firefighters. Everybody who saw a copy and was involved with the recovery or rescue operations was anxious to get a copy of it and use it to give them a mental picture of what was going on. Acting under the direction of FEMA, Tamaro also sent his own engineers below every day to continually update their maps. Structure intact observed 93001 AP, Andrew Pontecorvo, one of our engineers, got into this area, inspected it, determined it was suitable. Tamaro's engineers were joined by hundreds more who were volunteers, like Richard Garlock. We were the ones that were carrying drawings with clipboards and flashlights and just trying to, you know, look at a column or look at a location and say, okay, this is where I am in the drawing. And so that would put me, you know, how far from the nearest stair. The search teams left spray-painted codes to indicate that an area had been checked. An NYPD emergency services unit marked this area searched on September 17th. A task force sent from Florida inspected this subway station and left the initials FLTF to mark their presence. The spray-painted X signified a dangerous area. Keep out. The process would be repeated hundreds of times in the weeks to come. Where neither humans nor dogs could go, robots made the trip. Within six hours of the attacks, the first remotely controlled search and rescue robots were on the scene. They beamed back video of the devastation and deployed microphones ready to pick up a human cry for help. Later on, robots would find the remains of five victims of the attack. But by Monday, September 24th, Mayor Giuliani conceded that rescuers would need a miracle to find any more survivors beyond the five rescued in the first few days. With hope of a dramatic rescue all but gone, the work at Ground Zero became a recovery and debris removal operation. Joe Seabode of the Army Corps of Engineers had finally secured his dredging permits to create the channel that would allow large barges to carry off the wreckage of the World Trade Center. That survey showed that the average water depth was about four to five feet in here, 
And having worked with Weeks Marine, the contractor to New York City, we established that they needed about 15 feet to properly operate a barge in this location. First, divers like these took surveys of bottom conditions. They found debris, pier pilings, and cars, all of which could not be allowed to float free because they potentially could create a navigation hazard. Clamshell dredges on 144-foot-long barges were equipped to work day and night. An 1,890-horsepower winch powered a grappling device capable of lifting material weighing 80,000 pounds. The material dredged was taken to a disposal facility in New Jersey, where it was sealed off on its own site. The operation continued for nine days until there was sufficient draw for the debris barges to pass unhindered. That's worked really well, and we've been able to move now uh, over 500,000 tons uh, that they've moved. Uh, most all of the largest portion of that has gone by barge. Meanwhile, engineers completed their inspection of the subgrade levels beneath the tower footprints. They had bad news and evidence of a new threat. A mighty force of nature was advancing, and there wasn't much time to stop it. As complete as the destruction was at Ground Zero last September, the final outcome could have been worse. The World Trade Center was built on landfill at the mouth of the Hudson River and protected from that river only by a wall of concrete around the foundation. But for intrepid engineering, this whole site might have been submerged. As workers searched for victims and removed debris at the largest disaster site in America, far underground, there were signs of more trouble. When I arrived, I realized there were a good number of structural engineers on site who were uh, doing building surveys. And what I did was realize that nobody was looking at the below grade stuff. The basement levels, seven stories below grade, were unstable a hidden danger that threatened everyone who worked at the site. The first sign of trouble was a large crack in the pavement that appeared on Liberty Street at the southern edge of the disaster site. To George Tamero, a structural engineer, this indicated that a critical below-ground wall was damaged. We began to see cracks in the street which indicated that the wall was moving and the ground behind the wall was moving towards us. Tamero led the engineering team that oversaw the construction of the three-foot-thick, 70-foot-deep reinforced concrete perimeter wall. This was the wall known as the slurry wall that had posed an engineering challenge almost 35 years earlier. At that time, slurry was poured into a trench to provide support. Then workers lowered a pre-assembled steel cage of reinforcing rods that provided strength to the concrete that was poured in last. The slurry wall, also called the bathtub, kept the Hudson River from flooding the World Trade Center. Tamaro needed to know if it was damaged, but first, he had to find it. Initially, we had absolutely no idea of what the condition of the wall was. All we were encountered was utter devastation. You didn't know where the wall was. It was buried under piles of portions of the building. Because the slurry wall area was believed to be structurally unstable, Robots made the first reconnaissance. We're sending a small robot down the side of the slurry wall to inspect it. It's about 50 foot down, and then we're going to drive the robot as far as we can into the pile and see how far along the slurry wall it is still intact. The robot video was viewed by fire department personnel and safety officers, who helped determine if it was safe to send in engineers to have a look. Later, George Tamaro made his own underground inspection, and it confirmed his fears. The slurry wall had fallen prey to the terrorists' attack. As the South Tower crashed to earth, it cut a 200-foot-long gash through the basement floor support system, leaving the slurry wall unsupported. 
Deformed by the powerful pressure from the Hudson River, the wall was moving, inch by terrible inch. This drawing shows, for example, the outline of the slurry wall. It starts here at the south projection, runs along West Street, along Liberty Street, along Greenwich Street. There's this black line that I'm following along Veazey Street. Strengthening the slurry wall became a top priority, or else the site could flood. There are a large number of engineers that are carefully looking at the integrity of that uh, slurry wall, and all actions are being taken to ensure its integrity. We didn't have any more options, and we began to immediately backfill the hole. Tamaro's team put 40,000 cubic yards of material into an area running parallel to Liberty Street in order to stabilize the wall. Backfilling the wall in this way was only a temporary measure. And not only because the wall was under great pressure from the Hudson River, as evidenced by river water sluicing through a bundle of reinforcing cables known as a tieback, but also because of damage to the bathtub. The underground train line, path, that connected New York with New Jersey was flooding. There were two train tunnels, or tubes, north and south, and each needed a plug to stop the flow of river water. The Port Authority uh, wanted to plug the path tubes in Exchange Place so that they would prevent water from the World Trade Center coming into Exchange Place and traveling through the path system, potentially shutting the path system down. So we designed the plugs. We worked with the Port Authority to install the plugs. Saturday, September 29th. A 16-foot thick, 16-foot diameter bulkhead made of concrete, designed by Tamaro's engineers, was placed in the south tube by heavy construction equipment. A second plug for the north tube would be in place by October 9th. Dewatering wells were fashioned from lengths of plastic pipe fitted with small electric pumps. These were able to drain the water by pumping at a rate of 3,000 gallons per minute. Despite these measures, George Tamaro was still concerned about the slurry wall's ability to hold back the Hudson. We began to catch people's attention, and people have week by week gotten a better understanding of the delicacy or sensitivity of this wall and how important it is to retain its integrity. You do have so much instability below grade in the basement areas. You have these areas that are partially collapsed, and the construction activities often collapse them further. Tamaro wanted to install a new set of tiebacks, reinforcing cables, that would help the wall stay put. But this was no easy matter. The necessary drilling machines would not find safe purchase on the damaged basement slab. And if they broke through, rescue workers on the lower basement levels could be killed. There are two tools that are proving to be practical at this site. One tool is a track-mounted machine that sits on a set of caterpillar tracks and it just drills through the face of the wall down and does all of the operation, independent of the face of the wall. Where the basement slab was weakened or destroyed entirely, engineers worked with what are called floating leads. It's a drill rig that's hung from a crane outside the walls, and it permits the driller to get to the face of wall without risking his equipment or his personnel. The wall was stabilized. Tamaro's engineers felt their fixes would hold back the river and prevent the site from flooding. On the surface, firefighters and others continued to comb the debris for remains. Aside from huge pieces of twisted steel from the towers, there was little that was recognizable in the debris. Shrapnel-like fragments, gray dust. No one had ever seen anything like it even at the site of the Murrow Building in Oklahoma City, also destroyed by an act of terrorism. They said, you know, in Oklahoma City, you could see pieces of desks and chairs, and there was something that told you that uh, this was an office building. At the World Trade Center site, it seems like everything was pulverized. With no point of reference, recovery workers had no way of knowing if they were in the right place to find anything. The New York City Fire Department, in an effort to impose order, created a grid map for each sector of the disaster site. 
but it wasn't much use given the magnitude of the destruction. It's a very difficult to figure out, obviously, which grid cell you're in. When you're in 16 acres of pure destruction, there's very little that you can reference it to. The disorientation was keenly felt because recovery workers believed that charting each discovery might help them locate concentrations of remains. And engineers at the site believed that locating specific pieces of each building might help them understand how they collapsed. Dr. Sean Ahern thought he might have a solution. We went upstairs and, and, and uh, Chief Norman was, was on duty. And uh, I explained to him that uh, who we were, that you know, we were trying to deploy a, a GPS application. GPS, a global positioning system that would permit precise and instant geolocation. A GPS unit works by receiving signals from satellites in orbit around the Earth. The unit precisely measures the distance from its position up to the position of the satellites. By triangulating these reference points, the unit reads out the user's precise location. A company called Lynx Point helped Ahern put customized GPS units into the hands of firemen. These units combine the geolocation and identification functions in a single software package. Lynx Point specializes in geolocation put together a GPS application which enabled the firemen to go out, get a GPS location, get a timestamp, put a barcode on the bag containing the item, scan it, grab a drop-down menu which enumerated what the item was, boom, there they have it. Then they can take those points, bring them back to the mapping package, and map those points in space and time. But even as recovery workers picked through the rubble for human remains, there were doubts they would be able to identify what they found. The victims' families were hoping that the tireless work of the ground crews would bring them closure. Authorities knew that putting names to the remains found would require advanced technology. October 13th, more than a month following the attacks, the pit, as the site had come to be called, swarmed with activity. More than a thousand construction workers had so far removed 290,000 tons of debris. The Army Corps of Engineers dredging project had smoothed the way for its removal. We've reduced the distance that trucks need to travel by somewhere between 20 and 25 miles down to literally one half mile. The World Trade Center debris traveled by barge to a landfill on Staten Island called Fresh Kills. There it was placed on a conveyor belt and was sorted by hand. New York City police detectives with forensic training stood shoulder to shoulder to meet the grim and troubling task. I can't promise anybody I'm going to find every piece that was in that building, but I can look you square in the eye and say I tried. Forensic experts speculated that some victims may have been vaporized if they were on the floors where the airplanes penetrated. Still, the search for remains continued. Investigators were looking for evidence that might lead to the identification of a victim. A broken watch, a fragment of a credit card, a human body part, such as a hand, that could be fingerprinted. A few victims might be identified by traditional methods, such as jewelry, tattoos, and dental records. Most would require a DNA match. At the Bodie Technology Group in Virginia, thousands of vials, each representing an extinguished human life, began to arrive. One by one, they were logged into the computer tracking system. They were shipped to Virginia 
because the New York Medical Examiner's Office, the city agency responsible for victim identification, could not handle the volume of work generated by the World Trade Center attack. The first week, we put a process in place, and we were able to process a 1,000 bones in the first week. And that is something, I believe, that's never been done before by any forensic lab anywhere in the world. At Bodhi Technology, there were 13,000 vials to analyze. Each vial contained what investigators believed were the bone fragments of a single victim. Technicians would try to link those fragments to a name, a face, an identity. The first step was to drill into the bone fragments and get material from which DNA could be extracted. The DNA sample was processed through a series of chemical reagents that brought out what are called markers, a specific pattern of genetic code unique to each person. In the United States, we have forensics standardized on 13 different markers. And they are sections of the DNA where we actually measure the length of DNA in the marker. The DNA print that is finally done does look very much like a barcode. The DNA prints were sent to the medical examiner's office in New York, where they were compared with DNA samples taken from combs, toothbrushes, unwashed drinking cups, and other personal effects of the dead. If there was a match, the victim could be identified the family notified. When you can put the uh, remains together and be able to say to a family, here are your remains, and they can actually bury those remains of their loved ones, it does bring very good closure to them. I think that's ultimately the reward that all of us have for putting in the extra effort to make this happen. DNA technicians at Bodhi Technology knew the job was more difficult than most. Conditions in the pit, humidity, chemicals, high heat from the fires that still smoldered, all these could diminish the chance that good DNA would be extracted from the bones. The thing that's unique about the World Trade Center is as recently as the end of November, it was still 1,100 degrees down underneath the rubble, and so the remains there, unfortunately, are continuing to be subject to this heat and degradation. By April 2002, DNA work at Bodhi and other labs resulted in 218 positive victim identifications, with the official total of all victims at 2,824. The medical examiner's office had issued only 959 death certificates. An additional 1,735 death certificates were issued without a body at the request of the victim's families. This was done so that they could have some closure and receive death benefits. For months after the attacks, the pit remained active. Engineering experts made their way among steadily decreasing piles of rubble, deciding where heavy machines might be brought in safely. Our role is to make sure that the structure below is um, intact, so we've been doing condition assessments, and that it is safe to carry the loads of cranes and the backhoes and grapplers that the contractors are using to remove debris. We are still doing our coordinating role. We've removed about 750,000 tons of uh, debris and steel. Still have another 650 or more thousand tons to go. Other workers recovered evidence stored by law enforcement agencies and even gold stored in bank vaults. We're going to try and get around and get the rest of this. The things that were taken out were cars, CIA cars and Secret Service cars and U.S. Customs personnel cars and drug seizure cars. There was the Bank of Nova Scotia's vault, which had gold, silver, platinum that was removed. The precious metals, worth more than $230 million, were safe inside a vault in an area that narrowly escaped collapse. Following a recovery effort, every last gold, silver, and platinum bar was accounted for. As April turned to May, firefighters continued to rake the dust for any sign of a victim. Whenever one was found, all activities ceased out of respect.
people do not want to give up searching because it's fellow firemen, it's fellow police officers, it's civilians. You're hopeful just if you could find one. In what many described as a pilgrimage, scores of visitors came each day to see the site. At the six month anniversary of the attacks, 88 high powered searchlights were switched on to create a ghostly vision of the Twin Towers. The tribute in light remained for 32 nights. Finally, on May 30th, 2002, the recovery and cleanup effort drew to a close with the tolling of a fire bell and the sound of taps. Americans would mark the transformation of the World Trade Center from disaster site to hallowed ground. A single flag-draped stretcher was carried away to honor the victims who were never recovered. It had taken 1.5 million man hours to clear the site. Some 1.8 million tons of debris carted away in more than 107,000 truckloads. 20,000 body parts found. The remains of more than 1,100 of the 2,823 victims identified. Gradually, thoughts turned toward the future, and an engineering investigation into the tower's failure would pose difficult questions. In the spring of 2002, with the rubble cleared away, Ground Zero might have looked like an ordinary construction site. But its 16 acres held many souls and many secrets. Gene Corley, the engineer who was in charge of the federal inquiry into the destruction of the World Trade Center site, was ready to reveal his findings. He had formed a data collection team comprised of the nation's leading structural engineers and fire protection experts. For six months, they worked to understand the sequence of mechanical failures that brought the towers down. Their investigation included a careful inspection of steel columns from the towers that were brought to scrapyards. One of the things that we were interested in was to determine how hot the fire was in the tower prior to collapse. The way to determine that is to find pieces of steel that were involved in the fire, but had not been damaged further by the fire that occurred after the collapse. But finding the right pieces of steel required detective work. Clues came from the original construction workers who coded each piece of steel that they hoisted into position on the towers, marking its location in the structure. This procedure is not unusual, but it was done with particular diligence at the World Trade Center. Every piece of steel had the number stamped in showing exactly where it went in the building. Corley's team placed each piece of steel under the microscope to reveal its grain structure. Under the microscope, the metallurgist can look at it and tell us a great deal about what's happened to it in the fire. By studying abnormalities in the steel's grain structure, investigators determined how hot the metal became and thus learned what parts of the steel columns failed first. Corley's investigators combined this data with a visual analysis of the tower's collapse. They determined that although the aircraft were traveling at different speeds and struck at different levels, the aircraft impacts by themselves did not cause the towers to collapse. 
Rather, the damage caused by the impact combined with the effects of the fires were both to blame. Investigators also discovered an unanticipated weakness in the building's fireproofing. The tower floors were supported by relatively lightweight steel trusses spanning each level. These trusses were protected with a spray-on fireproofing. But in the extraordinary circumstances of September 11th, that form of fireproofing wasn't good enough. Corley's team believed that the aircraft impact blew away this protection, leaving the steel vulnerable to fire. When the aircraft hit, in each case, we believe that the fireproofing was knocked off. When hit by something going that fast and with that much energy in it, well, it's hard to get anything to stick to anything else. One of the crucial things to consider in this event is that the tremendous impact and immediate explosion after impact probably wiped out the fireproofing systems that were in place. So the steel then was left unprotected in that area of the blast. Subject to intense heat, the floor trusses pulled away from their connections and brought down the buildings, each floor pancaking onto the one below. The main role of the floor truss is to carry their self-weight plus office equipment and storage, whatever is on top of the floors. They have another function, though. They support the columns from moving laterally. If you remove the support from a column, you end up reducing its strength. Once the weakened columns gave way, the towers were fatally compromised. Corley's investigation also examined the escape routes available to those trapped in the World Trade Towers. One of the pioneering ideas put into practice by the architect of the World Trade Center, Minoru Yamasaki, was to create a building with an open plan free of internal columns. To open up floor space, Yamasaki grouped the elevator shafts and emergency stairs, for the most part, in the center. For one thing, it's easiest for people to move to the center of the building in an in emergency, and it gives them the shortest distance. On most floors, the three staircases were tightly clustered in the center core of the building. In the North Tower, they were struck by the incoming aircraft. The stairs were impassable, blocked by debris, and 1,344 people on the floors above the 91st floor impact zone had no exit. So far, we have not been able to identify anyone that did get out from above where the plane hit the North Tower. But in the impact zone of the South Tower, the staircases diverted around elevator machinery. Therefore, on floors 84 down to 78, two of the staircases were not close to the center of the core, but closer to its perimeter. Upon impact, one of them, on the northwest side, survived. Even though there was some damage, there was smoke in it, and it was not an attractive uh, way to go down, it still was passable. In the South Tower, as many as 18 people who were on or above the impact zone were able to escape to safety. Engineers questioned how the innovative tube and core design of the towers stood up to fire when compared to the older skeleton frame system. Corley's investigators believed that newer buildings, like the towers, were better because the connections between floors, columns, and walls were stronger than in many older buildings. As originally developed, the skeleton system itself does not automatically give you more safety because the connections between the beams, the floors, and the vertical members that carry load don't provide a lot of redundancy. Many older buildings would have done much worse than this building did. But really, very few buildings have been designed for anything even approaching what these buildings were hit with. When reporting his findings to Congress, Corley asked for further study into safer fire stairs. He also recommended developing durable fireproofing materials for skyscrapers. During public discussion of his findings, architects, government officials, and office workers wanted to know if it were possible to make a building terrorist-proof. It would be akin to building a fortress. 
And even if you did design a tower for an event like the World Trade Center that is 767 slamming into it, well, what about the next breed of airplane? You have 747 cargo plane, you have the Airbus, enormous planes. Where do you stop? The skyscraper is a device for expressing how powerful you are. And the question is, is the United States at this time trying to express how powerful it is, or is it perhaps looking at a more human scale and a more human relationship with the cities? In July 2002, six designs for a ground zero memorial and building development were submitted for public review. City officials were prepared for a long journey involving much public input to decide what to build on the World Trade Center site. What we have to do there is have a very appropriate memorial. We can't forget what's happened here, the many thousands of lives that have been lost. You know, there's just a lot of people who didn't come home and couldn't be buried. And that's really their burial ground, in essence. But I think you want to put buildings on that site as well. It's almost the American thing to do, to rebuild and, and, and move forward without forgetting the past. Born in 1974, destroyed in 2001, the World Trade Towers lasted only 27 years, a mere tick of eternity's clock. But for the people who built, maintained, and finally laid them to rest, the towers would always be giants. We enjoyed and loved the building and what we were doing. It was everyone's part enjoyed. The neighborhood grew up around the towers, and in essence, the towers and the rest of the buildings made that part of the city whole. New York may never again see structures so fearlessly grand. But though the physical buildings are gone, the courage and strength they expressed have now and forever become part of the American consciousness. A great debate is now underway in New York over what will eventually stand on this site. The first six plans for rebuilding were universally criticized, so the agency in charge of Lower Manhattan Development reopened the design competition to architectural firms from around the world. They're being asked to produce plans that include several elements favored by architectural critics and the general public alike. A tall structure that would once again shape the New York skyline a grand promenade to Battery Park, and space for offices, retail stores, and residences. Officials have also said they would give strong consideration to designs that preserve the outlines of where the Twin Towers once stood as a lasting memorial to the victims of September 11th. For the History Channel, I'm Arthur Kent. Thanks for joining us. Our historic look at the 9-11 year now continues with an interview we first brought you soon after the attack on the Twin Towers. Harry Smith sat down with Professor Angus Gillespie to discuss his reaction to the tragedy. That's coming up next. Please stay with us. We're going to take a final look back at the days following September 11th, a time in which many of us were still grappling with the loss of the Twin Towers. Harry Smith sat down with Professor Angus Crest Gillespie 
author of a behind-the-scenes book about the World Trade Center. He asked Gillespie about his reaction to the tragedy. We are joined now by Dr. Angus Cress Gillespie, a professor of American Studies at Rutgers University and the author of The Twin Towers, The Life of New York City's World Trade Center. Thank you very much for joining My us. My pleasure. Are you able to comprehend yet what happened to those buildings? No, I'm shocked. Uh, when I drove in to New York and I looked over there, they weren't there. And of course, I've been reading the news for the last three weeks. I should know. But I'm still stunned by the absence. It's like a kid with his teeth knocked out. Mm. Why do you think they were targets? Well, I argue in my book that uh, the Twin Towers were not just a pair of skyscrapers, but symbols. Uh, and it's not too hard to figure out why. Because of their proximity to Wall Street, by inference that they're identified with American capitalism, American finance, and by implication, the entire American way of life. And isn't it interesting in a way, they're called the World Trade Center, yet they never really were a center of world trade. It was the intention, originally, of the Port Authority to make it a center of world trade, and they made a good faith effort, initially, to recruit importers, exporters, freight forwarders, customs house brokers, steamship companies. But it unra the scheme unraveled because the price of the rentals went up and up and up, mm. and these mom and pop companies were sort of squeezed out and replaced by blue chip companies in the finance industry. All the more reason why they're identified with American finance and capitalism. Mm. I think it's no coincidence that the terrorists chose the symbol of American military might, the Pentagon, mm. and the symbol of American financial might, the Twin Towers. They're, they were perfect symbolic targets. Is it too early to say that the terrorist attack would be a pivotal, pivotal mark in our, not only our culture, but in our history? I've been thinking about that, and I think that's a fair statement. I think that people are saying to each other, where were you when you learned that this happened? And I don't remember this since the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I mean, if this is something that really changes our worldview. We will all of us remember where we were when we learned of this. It's so recent still, and we're in the throes of still trying to understand exactly what, what it all means. And I'm not sure any of us really have a clear idea yeah. of, of, of what, the, especially the long-lasting effects are going to be. Yeah. Well, we Americans, we like to think of ourselves as the good guys. And we're always shocked when we learn that somebody doesn't like us. Mm. And I think that going back to that symbolic component that uh, American capitalism and American financial life depends on a number of assumptions. Uh, the fluidity of capital, the mobility of labor, uh, the kind of secular assumption that everything has its price and can be bought and sold. Mm -hmm. And I think these ideas that we take for granted right. are deeply offensive to much of the rest of the world. So much was anticipated when this building was built. 150 mile an hour hurricane force winds, even as Frank Martini talked about the crash of a 707 into, into the superstructure. Could anyone have possibly foretold or thought for a second that terrorists would use jumbo jets as weapons of mass destruction to attack these buildings? No, I don't think so. I remember specifically talking to Frank Martini about this and other structural engineers, what were the stresses and strains. And indeed, they did build it to withstand the impact of a jetliner. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, what they had in mind was an accident. Yes. Uh, nobody envisioned kamikaze jetliners. And nobody envisioned the, the degree of high concept planning that these would be West Coast bound planes with a full load of fuel, which I'm told have the equivalent of four tanker trucks worth of fuel. Mm -hmm. And no building, I think, can be built to withstand that. Yeah. Uh, it's a whole new ball game. There's so much sentiment right now about rebuilding the buildings. At this point in time, good idea or bad idea? Emotionally, I would love to see them rebuilt exactly as they were, tit for tat. Mm -hmm. 
Intellectually, I'm skeptical. Uh, uh, there's a lot of good reasons not to do it. Dr. Gillespie, thanks for joining us. Good evening.